And the first one we'll mention is going to be this video from the Babylon Bee. As you know, our president, our fine president, has announced via Twitter video released at 6 a.m. in the morning that he is going to be running for re-election to be our resident. And the Babylon Bee has a way better campaign ad. And so let's just, you know, we'll show appreciation to them for doing the work that they're doing on a daily basis. It's great for us that we have people like this putting videos like this out. They spend a lot of time, a lot of money, no doubt, putting these things together. So let's start off with something funny right quick. In 2016, America entered a time of darkness. We elected an orange man who was literally Hitler, and the entire country suffered under his rule. But then, America was saved. Embraced by the loving arms of our new president, Joe Biden. Biden has brought back kindness and decorum. So you liar, man. Uh, look, uh, look, here's the deal. No, I wish you were in high school. I could take him behind the gym. Biden is a voice of clarity. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was in foot him in a foot, foot. A voice of reason. He is the smartest man I know. They're gonna put you all back in chains. And he's good with numbers. Let me start off with two words. Made in America. 700 billion and a trillion, 300 million billion dollars. Under his leadership, the Biden administration has brought us safety. It has brought us economic prosperity. It has empowered the next generation. Together, we will ensure things will continue to go the way they've been going forever and ever. I'm Joe Biden and I approve this, this, uh, wait, wait, who? You know the thing. Thanks, let's rent. All right, great job, Babylon B. Thank you for providing us some content today. Guys, this is, I know it's White Pill Wednesday, but holy crap. We're literally running a guy as president. It was bad enough the first time, but now he's running for re-election. And even the, the White House press secretary declined to answer whether or not Biden plans on serving the full second term, like whether or not he plans on being the president for another six years. She was like, I, I don't know. I can't speak to that. What? You can't. He's running for re-election. You you can't speak to whether or not he plans on serving his full second term. That's kind of important. You know why that's really important, by the way, is because of the person that's the vice president right now. And listen, she doesn't get enough credit. She's got a lot of really good quotes, too. And we haven't put any buttons on the board for her uh, because she isn't the president. But uh, let's listen to a, a, some really great deep thoughts from Kamala Harris. So. Oh. I think it's very important, as you have heard from so many incredible leaders, for us at every moment in time, and certainly this one, to see the moment in time in which we exist and are present, and to be able to contextualize it, to understand where we exist in the history and in the moment as it relates not only to the past but the future. What? What was, does anyone know what she was even just saying? Now, I know that it's, it's taken out of context. We didn't hear all the ramblings that went on before and afterwards, but it really does remind me of that quote from Michael Scott, where he says that sometimes he just starts a sentence and he has no idea where it's going. You know, don't, don't ever for any reason, no matter how much or it's just, that's exactly what it sounds like to me when she's out there talking. It's a little bit scary. And hey, before we go any further in this episode, I want to tell you, this is not an ad. It is my understanding that one of our members today has a birthday. And I wanted to give a birthday shout out before I forget right now to Tom. I'm not giving you his last name. Okay. So I wanted to make sure this, this dude who has been following and hanging out with us for his last name is formerly Homer. Yeah, thank you. For some reason, I don't remember how that started. Y your name was Homer in one of the groups. I'm not really sure. Then it turned into Tom, formerly Homer. Uh, but Tom's great. He's been supporting us for a long time. Uh, one of our, uh, I would say, original, he's like in the original 
twenty supporters probably. He come and came and hang out, hung out for the uh, the five hundredth episode party, which we're about to hit a thousand here pretty soon. So he came all the way to Nashville from New Jersey, I believe. And so Tom, happy birthday! We surely do appreciate you being here all the time and for all the support. I just wanted to make sure that we gave you a nice birthday uh, shout out uh, for sure. Let's get on to the next white pill thing. So we got Biden. He's running for re-election. The Babylon Bee video was really good. Kamala Harris, I mean, statistically, guys, what do you think the chances are that she's going to end up being the president by default? They're going up with every day that passes. All right, so we should take that into consideration, into consideration I think, anyway. Well, let's get into some other news. Aside from Biden and Kamala, and this comes out of Michigan. Now, we don't exactly agree with everything that comes out of Michigan, but when you see something that's good, we should point it out. And this came from the Good News Network. Michigan clears criminal records for thousands of low-level, nonviolent offenders. They're calling this uh, meaningful second chances. Now, why would this be a white pill? Well, first off, a lot of the things that these people were convicted of probably shouldn't be illegal in the first place. Just say a lot of drug stuff, like things like that, nonviolent crimes. Okay, now this could include some theft and things, but they do have have some filters on who they're going to be clearing the records of. But let's go through some of this article. Criminal justice reform signed three years ago in the U.S. state of Michigan took effect last week with nearly 850,000 residents seeing at least one conviction automatically set aside. The bipartisan clean slate legislation, as advocates call it, triggered an automatic expungement process starting last Tuesday, wiping clean a range of convictions from people's records following a defined waiting period. Michigan has about 2.8 million people with criminal records. Many of those convictions are low-level, nonviolent offenses, while others were committed as juveniles. Before the new expungement laws, those offenses stuck to records and acted as barriers to housing and employment opportunities. This is something that, first off, when it's a nonviolent crime, especially if this falls into the category of things that shouldn't even be illegal in the first place, these things, these things stick with you for a long time and they can ruin your life. It, now, ruining your life based on something that shouldn't even be illegal in the first place, as libertarians, that, that's not something that... Uh, we agree with. In fact, I happen to be wearing a shirt today, and this is just by happenstance. I'm wearing a shirt that says, no victim, no crime. This is a Felony Friday shirt, the old-fashioned Lions of Liberty shirt right here. Thanks, John Odermatt, for sending over uh, this shirt, the side I was going to wear today for White Pill Wednesday. On April 11th alone, when the automatic expungement program began, 252,000 Michiganders became conviction-free as their criminal records were sealed. Research has shown favorable outcomes for employment and income for people whose records have been expunged, along with a lower reoffense rate than than compared to the general public. Safe and Just estimates that going forward, the program will expunge between 100 and 200,000 low-level nonviolent criminal records annually. Convictions will be eligible for permanent sealing after seven years for up to four misdemeanors and after either 10 years for up to two violent, two nonviolent felonies or the completion of a prison term. Now, the completion of a prison term thing is also important because I happen to believe that once you finish your prison term, you have paid your debt to society. Justice has been served at that point and that you should be, uh, you should be reassimilated into being a citizen with all of your normal rights that everyone else has because they're a citizen or because the government protects those rights for those people. And too often, I think, even when people serve their prison sentence and they get let out, we treat them like a different class of people forever. But what's the point of letting someone out if you aren't saying that they're ready to rejoin society? In that case, you shouldn't let them out, right? It kind of defies the point, in my opinion. So this is a good thing to me. And that's why it's on White Pill Wednesday. Now, I want to get into this Bud Light thing. Bud Light presents... I really think someone should have done a real Men of Genius ad. And I saw people say uh, different ways of doing it. It needs to be real Men of Genius. Now, I know it's too late to do this, but it should have been real Men of Genius because Dylan Mulvaney is a man that's pretending to be a little girl. And so the funny part would 
be to keep it real men of genius and celebrate Dylan Mulvaney. I, I think that would have been a, a pretty good one. Hopefully someone actually did that song. I want to hear the whole song, like the full commercial, you know, I uh, and then get sued by Bud Light or Anheuser-Busch uh, afterwards. But this story from the New York Times, I believe just out today or yesterday, ad flap leaves bitter aftertaste for Bud Light and warning for big business. So why is this a white pill? It's not so much that they've decided to backtrack and fire these people, which personally, I'm glad that that happened. I'm not the biggest fan of boycotts, but it seems like this one may have worked. In fact, it looks like it definitely did work. The reason I see this as a white pill is because of the warning for big business. What I would like to see are businesses not taking a political stance. I really just want them to take a stance on whether or not they've got the best products and providing the best products to their customers. That is what I would like to see. And I hope that this is a warning for the future for some of these businesses that want to uh, just dive into the culture war that they need to think this all the way through. And this one was definitely not thought all the way through. Let's go through some of this New York Times article. Oh, was that a real Men of Genius ad right there? Maybe it is. Already got that. I'll have to, I'll have to watch that later on. When she was named Anheuser-Busch's marketing vice president, Alyssa Heinerscheid, I don't know if that's right. Alyssa explained, I had this super clear mandate. We need to evolve and elevate this incredibly iconic brand. Doing that, she said, means having a campaign that's truly inclusive. Now, the first thing I wanted to point out was I don't understand this truly inclusive thing. Like if you don't have an ad that features every single segment of the population specifically, then your brand isn't inclusive. Could trans people not buy Bud Lights if they wanted to do that to themselves? I. I think they still could. I don't understand why doing this type of ad means that it's more inclusive as if there's some type of rule set up to where trans people couldn't buy Bud Light. That's what it sounds like to me. Continuing on, but the limits of that mandate, that is to have a campaign that's truly inclusive and evolve the iconic brand, the limits of that mandate and of how Anheuser-Busch defined inclusive became apparent Friday when the company announced that Ms. Heinerscheid and her boss, Daniel Blake, we're on a leave of absence after a wave of right-wing outrage over a Bud Light marketing campaign that involved the transgender influencer Dylan Mulvaney. The backlash and subsequent scram scrambling provide a lesson in the newly unsettled politics of corporate America. In the past decade, major companies have leaned into liberal social politics that are increasingly anathema to their long-standing allies and the Republican Party and the consumers who vote for them, also for the customers who use those businesses' products. This one that they jumped into was an extremely, extremely divisive issue, which is, which is why they jumped into it in the first place. That's why I am glad that they ended up getting a lot of pushback on this because they knew what they were doing. They knew what stand they were taking. They literally picked the most hot-button divisive person that there was out there doing this thing and decided to basically throw up a middle finger to all the people who didn't like Dylan Mulvaney. And if you're going to throw up a middle finger to people, then you should be ready for a bunch of other people throwing middle fingers back at you. So they got what they deserved. The resulting furor, however, has led to double-digit sales declines in rural red state markets. I saw several news headlines saying that the sales had dropped 17%. Um, already, I actually think that's going to be more because we are still pretty uh, close to the time that they did this. And you got to wait for people to be reordering more alcohol. People could have been ordering the same thing they were ordering the week before because they order the same thing all the time. And now I think we're going to see actual sales numbers when they report their next uh, quarterly earnings results, where a broader, a broader revolt against transgender rights has become a has become central to Republican politics, a revolt against transgender rights. Now, this is not a dumb bleep. This is a white pill, okay? But I did highlight this transgender rights part because it is interesting how people 
uh, phrase specific situations, how they actually want you to think about it. What is it that Republicans are revolting against? Well, it's transgender rights and all of these things that people are pushing for. That's just people's rights. Uh, that's not people wanting to protect children or anything like that. Quote, they've stepped into a polarized America, said Ben Steinman, the editor of Beer Marketers Insights, an industry trade publication. They're in the center of the culture wars in a way that no company could possibly want to be. Now, you put yourself in the center of the culture. That's literally why you picked the person, was to put yourself in the center of the culture war. Like, what did you think was going to happen? I, I don't know what else they expected to happen. They knew exactly what they were doing. And another reason they should have known that this was going to happen is that, as we've discussed before, people, while they want to be... People want to be nice and they want to be accepting. But when it comes to actual parts, uh, say sports, transgender people in sports and whether or not you're going to play based on your birth, gender or whatever your identity is, people are pretty clear on that. We've gone through a lot of polling results on this kind of thing. And I know that this is just in sports, but that really does show you what people's views on the matter are especially when you think about what Dylan Mulvaney is out there pushing all the time and what the overall narrative is out there. People do not overall agree with this. When you look at this from Gallup, uh, U.S. adults, the percentage that say uh, they should play on teams that match their gender identity, that's 34% of the respondents, or play on teams that match their birth gender, uh, that is 62% of the respondents. So pretty, pretty overwhelming majority that go, you can even go down to something like openly transgender men and women serving in the military. What percentage of people favor this? Now, these two numbers are from 2019 to 2021. 71% favored openly transgender men and women serving in the military in, in uh, 2019, 71%. In 2021, that went down to 66%. And in fact, across almost everything, independents, Democrats, men, women, all age groups, all went down for the percentage of people that, uh, that actually favored transgender people serving in the military. And I know that's just the, that's the military, but this really should give you an insight into what people overall, where they are on this issue. And, and this marketing person just did not pay attention to these things at all. Let's get back into the article. And I'm going to show you some charts. Sales of Bud Light, the largest brand for Anheuser-Busch, dropped 17% by value for the week ending April 15th, compared with a year ago, according to one industry report. In a statement about the executives on leave, Anheuser said, quote, this, I highlighted this because, come on, corporations, we all know when you're BSing and just saying stuff, but it's something that we've all just accepted. And if you work in a corporate job, you know what I mean. All these buzzwords that people say, they know that they're BS. You talk to them behind the scenes and they're like, oh yeah, I'm just going to BS a bunch of stuff. But then they say it to the workers and then the workers have to talk in this BS corporate talk and the emails and stuff like that. And they all know that it's fake. No one likes it, but it's just something they have to do. Here was their quote on what they have to do. We have made some adjustments to streamline the structure of our marketing function to reduce layers so that our most senior marketers are more closely connected to every aspect of our brand's activities. Well, thank you for clarifying that. What that means is they're going to have to go uh, to the top with marketing ideas like this. Despite the drop, Anheuser-Busch's stock has barely faltered and is currently near its high point in the past year. This is something I wanted to caution people on the right on because I saw a lot of people jumping on this, oh, Anheuser-Busch's stock dropped. And then what they talk about was the market cap that Anheuser-Busch lost. Now, they've got a really big market cap, okay? It is very risky to use things like drops in the company's stock as some type of a win. It's very dangerous to do that because then what point do you make when the stock goes back up and it goes back up over the previous highs? Well, by default, you're saying that it ended up not having an effect and the company is going to be fine. And so you got to be careful when you're making these types of points. Let me just show you. Now, I know that they dropped Dylan Mulvaney and you could say that's part of the reason for the stock going up. 
uh, during when this news came out, when this uh, endorsement sponsorship happened, they dropped five percent. Okay, that's that's not Tesla dropped ten percent a day last week. You know, it's companies drop now. Of course, they drop because of this, because of the boycotts. And you could say, well, this is a win. This is a big win. Well, well, then what do you do now when you look at their stock price and they're only down 0.4% since that high? It's very dangerous. And then whenever you look at their overall stock movement over the last year, where I have it circled, that's the Dylan Mulvaney thing. And you look at all the other big movements they've had back and forth. It's very difficult to use drops in stock price and take that as some type of a win. Okay, that's what I'm saying is, it's a very risky standpoint to take because when that move is erased and there's still value being added, well, you kind of kill your point, right? I'm just, that's not something that we, we ever like to point to. I just want to point that out to people. The extent to which the backlash against Bud Light has affected the company's sales is unusual. Other companies that have in recent years found themselves the target of ire on the right over race and gender politics like Nike and Disney or on the left over support of former President Trump and his stolen election claims like Goya Foods, pay little for it with the consumers. Well, the reason here is very clear. You have to look at your clientele. You got to look at the demographic of the people that consume your product. You're talking about Nike and Disney. Of course, that didn't have as much of an effect whenever you started going towards the left culture war as freaking Bud Light going towards the left on the culture war and putting out rainbow colored bottles and having Dylan Mulvaney's face on these, on these cans. I know that wasn't like a widely released can. It was a special can they sent out. A lot of people probably thought that that was going to be on the can when they went to buy it at the gas station. I don't know. The company's backtracking though has left it with few defenders. You see, here's where they mess up again. I mean, they kind of had to, but if you're going to make a move and then you're going to backtrack, if people get mad about it, then don't do the move. That's where, that's where you got to think long-term as a company because now they're going to make everyone mad. The people on the right, okay, maybe they're happy that they dropped the sponsorship and they fired a couple of marketing people, but they're going to still be left with a bad taste in their mouths, whether they're drinking Bud Light or not. And so that's going to hurt them with sales. And now people on the left are going to get mad that Bud Light fired these people and dropped the sponsorship with Dylan Mulvaney. And so now you've, you've actually hurt yourself no matter what you do. So what I'm saying is, before you take a stance, companies, make sure that if people get mad, you're not just going to back away from it, because then you're just going to be left making everyone mad. Quote, this was their opportunity to say, we do stand with the LGBTQ community, and specifically the trans community, said Stacey Lentz, a chief executive of the Stonewall Inn, gives back initiative, the philanthropic foundation of the historic gay bar in Manhattan. Now, why am I leaving these quotes in here? Because I've heard a lot of people say, and even people on the right or libertarian say, well, this boycott is ridiculous. We shouldn't be doing stuff like this. You shouldn't get all mad. Well, this person brings up the fact, or New York Times brings up the fact that the Stonewall End, the Stonewall Inn was refusing to sell Anheuser-Busch products just a couple of years ago because they were donating to Republican lawmakers. And so the left was already boycotting Anheuser-Busch products because they donate to Republicans. And so didn't they kind of start this whole back and forth by trying to boycott Bud Light or Anheuser-Busch products because of their political donations? So overall, the reason I see this as a white pill is because I want corporations to stop doing this, just have the best product and stop trying to pander to people. Like in that first quote where she says we wanted to be truly inclusive, what does that mean? There's no rules on who can buy the beer. How do you, you got to prove yourself that you're inclusive, that, that you got to extend your hand out to every single group of people and show that you want them drinking your beer. Just advertise that you've got the best crappy beer and that that's why people should buy it because it's cheap and crappy. And if you're looking for that, then get Bud Light. So... I don't know, overall, just, it's a frustrating situation. It was an annoying situation. I think it ended up about the best way it could have, which is them learning a lesson and hopefully teaching that lesson to a bunch of other people. Let's go to a clip from Bill Maher. We try to play good Bill Maher clips. You know, he's a lefty. He's still on HBO. 
still a lot of lefties, I guess, that watch his show, but he brings up a point uh, that needs to be brought up, of course. And let me find this clip right there. There we go. There's the clip. Now, when we talk about gun violence, and specifically interracial gun violence, there's this narrative out there, and I just saw a post, I think, in the Wa the Washington Post yesterday about about uh, about young black kids being scared uh, to go out, and it was specifically talking about just getting killed and racist violence, and just getting killed by a white person. Of course, we had the the kid who rang the wrong doorbell and ended up getting shot a couple times, and this is just something that that if you're black, you've just got to live with it. You just never know when you might cross a white person the wrong way uh, and and just end up getting shot for it. And of course, when you look at the statistics, that's just not, if you're going to be worried about gun violence, that's just not what you should be worried about is that specific type. Bill Maher, let's go. Like Chicago, like most of the, the shootings are young black men killing other young black men. Is that not correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay much more than, than what the cops do. Why doesn't anybody talk about that? Well, I mean, uh, why aren't there, uh, you know, a, a, a hundred giant black celebrities who would have the respect of those people saying, what are you doing to yourselves? Why are you killing each other? This I mean, is I no just... way to live. This dishonors our community. Come on, uh, we're better than this. Right. I feel like it's never addressed. It's. And what I would uh, want to observe is that any structural move that you want to make requires a majority of the people to get behind it, requires democratic oh. politics to get behind it. And in order to get a majority of the voters in Chicago or any place else to get behind anything that's going to cost them money, they have to feel safe. They have to feel that the people who are in charge are on their side. And that's why Mayor-elect Brandon Johnson needs to come and give speeches in which he says this is contemptible behavior. We won't tolerate it in our city. The reason we have cops is precisely in order to stop this from happening. And if you do it on, our, on my watch, you're going to go to jail. Okay. I think that's a good white pill. It's from last week sometime, but uh, we haven't done a, a white pill episode since then. This is a message that people need to hear. And it's also one of these, it's one of these narratives that's tearing apart our society right now that it's black people who have to be scared of white people killing them. And it's, I mean, you just look at the numbers and it's, it's not true. And it seems like the actual numbers are just being ignored. I'm not just saying this because I'm white or anything, but if you're going to, if you're going to terrify an entire generation of people uh, and make them scared of something that is statistically very low likelihood to happen. I just find it really wrong when you, you separate that out by race and tell people they have to be scared of white people. Like, why are we not making as big of a deal about black people killing black people? It sounds cliche to say these times, but it's that narrative right there that people are willing to lie about that causes a bunch of this racial animosity that we've got right now. And let's go on to another white pill video. This is Senator Ron Johnson talking about Social Security. This is a sitting senator talking about a massive, massive government, government program. And it's just good to hear this becoming part of, I guess, mainstream conversation as it should be. The fact that Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. But my point was we need to understand the total amount of government spending every year and if you want to save, and I do, I want to save, all I've ever said about Social Security is I want to save it. The greatest threat to Social Security is the massive debt and deficit spending. When, when this trust fund runs out, we've already crossed the Rubicon of benefits are exceeding revenue. And so the trust fund, and that's just an accounting gimmick, by the way. That's all that is. There's no real assets behind that. It's just treasury bonds. They have no value to the federal government. It is a legal Ponzi scheme. I'm happy to defend that comment all day long. I mean, again, that's what a Ponzi scheme is. You get in early investors. You don't invest the money for them. You spend it, but you bring in the, you know, the current investors and you pay off the, the former investors, right? That's what a, so, but this is a legal Ponzi scheme. Okay, so the greatest threat to that Social Security is when the trust fund runs out and you have nothing now to redeem to plus up the benefits, will we have the financial wherewithal out of the general fund to honor those promises? 
That's why we need to be concerned about the debt and deficit. You know, when that happens, we'll be about $50 trillion in debt, according to Biden's budget. All right. Not something that we don't already know, uh, but it's something that people need to be saying more often. Uh, our entitlements, Social Security, got to be reformed somehow. All right. I would like to completely phase it out and privatize it and allow people to opt out of it. But people have got to eventually come to terms with the fact that this does not work. All right. This is a Ponzi scheme. It starts with recognizing that this is the literal setup of a Ponzi scheme. The people who are paying them right now are paying off the old former investors that are now trying to take their money back out of the system. And when you get older, the only way you're going to get money back out is if there are new people in the system paying money into that system. All right. There's not some type of, I know there is a trust fund. It's going to end up running out pretty soon. And getting people to the point where they realize that this system doesn't work, especially with our birth rate, the way that we have it and the amount of people uh, that are paying into it um, compared to the people that are taken out of it with that number declining. It's just not something that's going to continue to work. We can't just, we can't just pretend that it's going to be able to keep going and everything's going to be fine. And what he's saying is once that trust fund runs out, we got to start paying that out of our general budget. And we ain't got the money. We're going to have to borrow a ton of money to do this or print a bunch of money to do this. And people got to get their heads out of the sand. And that's going to start with real, realizing that this system is, uh, you know, people look at Ponzi schemes. I think it's a bad thing. But they all think Social Security somehow is going to work. Eventually, the Ponzi schemes come to an end. And that's what this one's going to have to do. This one was posted by the redheaded libertarian. She says, give this man a medal. And this was a, an event where there were uh, a bunch of journalists speaking. And this person interrupts the event and is asking where Seymour Hirsch is at the event and makes quite a few pretty good points. I don't know how long I'll let this one play. It's three minutes long, uh, but stands up and kind of stops the event with questions about why they are ignoring Seymour Hirsch, who, of course, uh, is the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who is now saying that someone has come forward saying that the U.S. actually helped destroy the Nord, Nord Stream pipeline along with Ukraine and some other some other countries. So anyway, let's listen to this moment. Oh, is this the lecture hall with Seymour Hirsch? I, I just I'm looking for the one with Seymour Hirsch because it's a policy and press hall event. So shouldn't we be talking about the Nord Stream since that's the biggest story of the century and you guys, you know, I'm sorry. I mean, you have the executive editor of the New York Times there who came out with a phony story to try and block Seymour Hirsch. It just it's just kind of funny how that happened. You know, I mean, did you even acknowledge Seymour Hirsch? All of you are executive editors of papers that broke Pentagon, Me Lai, Watergate. Is this the same papers or not? I mean, is there anything you've gotten right? in the last 20 years or am I mistaken about that? I mean, it's just kind of funny because Iraq, wrong, Syria, wrong, Russiagate, really wrong, okay? I mean, the list goes on and on. So the last thing you could do to try and actually fix your reputation is acknowledge that through leaks, we had to find out that Zelensky was going to bomb Moscow on the anniversary. I mean, if you're so impartial, shouldn't you at least say, right, that Zelensky was going to bring us on the verge of World War III? That seems pretty fair. While Julian Assange rots in prison, all of you've got, you know, fat checks because he's in jail for doing your job. And you know what? Tucker Carlson ain't no Seymour Hirsch, but he did something you guys are scared to do. Speak the truth and actually be critical of the war, which is why he was. Okay. Good job. Whoever this guy is, I want to know who he is. We need more people like this that will stand up and call these people out at what I don't know what the event exactly was but you see a bunch of journalists up on the stage and they're talking to i don't know who all the people are a little convention room you know giving a nice little event uh speaking to them about journalism and he makes some really good points and he calls it like the biggest event of the century guys we're, there's a really good chance not saying that i know we did but there's a really good chance that we helped or actually carried out the destruction of one of Germany's main energy supply lines. That's a pretty big story, you know? And the newspapers are just running cover 
for the government, like they always have been doing. He calls them out on helping lie us into the wars. And uh, just overall, really good job. Now, he does mention Julian Assange. Most of the major newspapers have signed on saying that they think Julian Assange needs to be released and have all the charges dropped. I, I will I will make that point on, on their behalf. Uh, but anyway, just good job for this guy having the guts to stand up and and say these things we need more more of this all right another thing i want to talk about here you know that we're big or very much against antitrust and this one involves apple well there was a ruling just a couple days ago uh from the u.s court of appeals for the ninth circuit in favor of apple saying that they were not exercising monopoly power and now this they could still have the DOJ bring a, a suit against them, but this actually deals a blow to the entire case, and it kind of sends a signal to them that they might need to back off because the courts aren't going to be as favorable. Now, this concerns something that I was not aware of until I started reading about it over the last year or so between Apple and Epic Games. And uh, this had to do with, was it, was it Fortnite? I can't believe, I can't remember what exact game it was. I don't play games, y'all. Um, I mean that literally. Uh, I don't. I don't do any games. So they sued Apple because Apple charges a thirty percent commission when you buy things through the app. It's got to go through their app store, and they charge a thirty percent commission. And so people have been trying to find ways around this. All right. I do especially like how people talk about this as a tax and how it raises prices. And then even newspapers like the Washington Post will point out that people would offer it for lower on their website. If people went to get it there, uh, they would give a discount because that commission was not being taken on top. In fact, Twitter, by the way, does the same thing. If you subscribe to Twitter Blue, if you use the app store, if you use your Twitter app to subscribe to Twitter Blue, it's $11. I know we keep hearing the thing about $8. It's $11 if you do it through the app through the app store. If you do it through a web browser, it's $8. So they also charge more because of that. I am confused as to why Apple went so hard after Epic Games for what they did, uh, which was essentially, they created their own kind of currency and you would, you would buy, I think what they called like V-Bucks and you would use that to purchase things in the app store. I mean, Amazon does the same thing kind of same thing with uh, with Audible. I used to wonder and get so mad, like, why can't I just buy a book on Audible on my Audible app? Well, you can't do that because Apple takes a portion of all of those sales. And so what Audible does is through your subscription that you sign up for, they give you credits through your subscription. And then you can just use a credit on the app to purchase a book. The reason they have the credit system is because that gets around their 30% commission that they got to pay out to Apple. It's super annoying, uh, but I now realize why they actually do this. And I don't know why Apple hasn't gone after Amazon like they went after Epic. But let me tell you about this ruling and some of the ridiculous things that I saw in it. Overall, a good thing, I think. U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit agreed with a lower court's 2021 decision that Epic Games, the maker of Fortnite, failed to prove that Apple's App Store policies constituted anti-competitive conduct in violation of federal antitrust laws. The court, however, upheld the lower court's ruling that Apple ran afoul of the California competition laws because it forces developers to use Apple's payment processing service without allowing them to tell customers about cheaper alternatives. So this will change one thing. When you go to buy something, these apps have basically been blocked from giving you a link where you can open it up in your browser and buy it outside of the app store. And they did rule that Apple has to allow you to be given a link to go outside of their store and purchase these things. So they're, they're still not going to like that very much. The appeals court decision could mark a blow to the federal government's efforts. Here's the white pill. Could mark a blow to the federal government's efforts to challenge alleged monopoly behavior in Silicon Valley amid ongoing litigation with tech giants, including Google and Meta, the parent company of Facebook. I know that a lot of people won't take this as, as much of a white pill as I do. I'm very much against antitrust laws. Do I like monopolies? No, uh, but we also don't have very many, if any, monopolies. And their definition of monopoly has widened 
grown over time to include basically any big company. And I do not agree with that whatsoever. I think this is Apple's app store. That's Google's app store. And they can charge what they want if you want your company's product to be sold on that store. That's just my opinion. The case was portrayed as a David and Goliath battle between the world's most valuable company and a popular video game maker and widely seen as a bellwether of growing efforts to bring antitrust challenges against Silicon Valley. But once again, there's a white pill uh, that the, the DOJ is going to see. Okay, well, maybe the courts aren't going to be as favorable in these cases as we think they might be. Federal agencies and policymakers have highlighted ways that Apple and Google allegedly use singular authority. I like how two separate companies use their singular authority over app stores to boost their own services. Now I changed this a little bit. You could see if you're looking at the screen and you can watch this on YouTube if you want. I, they said singular authority over app stores to boost their own services. Well, they use singular authority over their own app stores to boost their own services and damage rivals. Epic's case elevated long-running criticisms that the 30% commission Apple charges on purchases make its app store and in-app payment systems uh, that they un unfairly taxes developers. Unfairly taxes developers. This is a tax that uh, you pay voluntarily if you, in fact, want to use their system. And I found plenty of articles talking about how this raises the prices of everything that you pay for in the app store. Isn't that weird how easy it is to come to that conclusion when you're talking about a company charging a commission on top of something and not the taxes that we all pay on all the money that we get paid or that the, the, uh, the money that we pay every time we buy something, things like that nature. It's so difficult for them to come to that conclusion then, but when it's actually in a market, a somewhat free market, it's very easy to see that something they call a tax is leading things to be more expensive. The Department of Justice for years has investigated Apple's App Store practices and last year filed a brief with the Ninth Circuit arguing that the 2021 decision and the Apple and Epic litigation was overly narrow and could imperil the federal government's efforts to, in to enforce antitrust laws. The Federal Appeals Court, Appeals Court nodded to the broader regulatory debate in Monday's decision, quote, they said there is a lively and important debate about the role played in our economy and democracy by online transaction platforms with market power. How the hell did the judges decide or the judge decide to put that they are endangering our democracy with their transaction platforms and market power. I just feel like someone's been watching too much Democrat propaganda lately, but that's just me. Quote, our job as a federal court of appeals, however, is not to resolve that debate, nor could we even attempt to do so. Guys, the court process is still working. They're not going to be able to do all the antitrust stuff that they want to do. I find that to be a really good thing. Apple spokesman Marnie Goldberg celebrated the ruling as a resounding victory, saying to the firm that the company abides by antitrust laws. Epic Games CEO Tim Sweeney said in the tweet that Apple prevailed, though he praised part of the court's decision when it comes to allowing people to exit the app uh, to purchase things via a link in those, uh, in those stores. Now, I don't know exactly where I come down on that one. If Apple wants to block someone uh, from putting a link in there, I don't know, kind of still is their place, but at least you do get more choice in the matter. Uh, and that'll, I guess, put some more pressure on Apple to think about their commission fees. Overall, like I said, to me, antitrust is just a tool used by the government to control these businesses. Their threats of bringing antitrust cases are used to control things like speech and privacy and all sorts of other issues out there. And when we look at things like the Twitter files, and we know that the Facebook files would be way worse, um, they use threats of antitrust to control these companies and to use these companies to take away your rights on their behalf. And so this threat of antitrust litigation, while we might agree with some of the things, like, oh, I don't like that Apple didn't put a link in there, I don't like that they took Epic Games off of the App Store or whatever, um, the fact that it's not going to be so easy 
for the DOJ to go through the courts here uh, and to show Apple that they don't have to be as worried about the antitrust threats uh, that have been way, that have been held over their head all this time. Um, I find that to be a very big white pill because it affects, like I said, more than just games on the App Store. This affects this uh, this this affects censorship of speech. This this affects people's right to uh, start their own platforms. You know, we have platforms taken off of the stores. Uh, you think that antitrust threats didn't have anything to do with that with these companies? Now, this is a this is a good thing, okay? All right, folks. Those are some white pills for you. I hope that uh, well, I hope you liked it. A couple funny videos, a couple good videos where people made some good points. Sorry, Charlie's not here. I'm sorry, it's just me. That's still a 48 minute episode. Jeez, how does that even happen? Still 48 minutes. I really would appreciate it if you would tell a family member and a friend about the show. And as we've been telling you, download the Converso app if you want to have truly private messages and phone calls between you and your loved ones and your friends. You've been sharing your messages and your phone calls with your personal FBI agent. And I think that us as libertarians, we can greatly appreciate the value of actual privacy. End-to-end -end encryption, they never get stored on a server in the process, all right? All they get is your phone number, but that's it. You can also unsend messages and block uh, people from screenshotting your messages, which is a really, really cool feature. So download Converso and send me a message telling me that you heard this ad, 555-184-3042, 555-184-3042. The link is in the show notes, and the number is too if you don't remember it. All right, that's it. That's the show. Tell a friend, tell a family member, and tell the children that they need to subscribe and follow Good Morning Liberty so you can get some Liberty goodness just directly injected into your brain via the podcast app every single day of the week when we want to. If you do all of those things that I just mentioned, and I mean all of them, we'll be right back here again tomorrow. Same Liberty time, same Liberty channel. Until then, have a good day and a good morning, Liberty. Okay, um, hang on. Uh, sorry. Oh.